Hello and welcome to another booktube video from me Lauren from Lauren and the Books. What a treat we're all in for today because today's video is one of my favourite videos to film actually is uh, my best books of the year so far. So we are over halfway through the year. Normally I film this in June but I've done it in July this year um, and I'm going to talk about the 10 books that I've read in the first half of the year that are my faves from the first half of the year so hopefully you'll find some recommendations in here um, this is also sort of like summer holiday time so maybe you'll find something in here that you might want to take away on holiday and also I will be watching this back come December um, to see if these books have made it to my best books of the year entirety so hello Lauren in December Merry Christmas um, Something I will just say before I get into the books, and there's there's ten books. Um, I have had, I imagine, the, uh, I have, I'm sure, the best reading year that I have had since I started BookTube. Probably the best reading year ever. Now I've also heard a, other, a few other BookTubers say that this year. So maybe 2023 is just a real special year for reading. But yeah, I am literally reading banger after banger after banger this year. So delighted to share with you these ten books and how much I've loved them. Now, they're not in any particular order. The order in I save for the best books of the year, so that's when I put them in sort of like graded order. So I've got 10 books here, and they will appear in any sort of order. I think they're roughly appearing in the order in which I read them. Um, but we'll start with the first book, the only book on this list by a man, um, and that's uh, Sometimes People Die by Simon Stevenson. I read this back in January. Um, got this recommendation from Sarah Cox's show, and you know, this, I gave this four stars at the time, so it just goes to show this is another thing I love about best books, is that not necessarily, like, the four starers can still appear on there because they might just live sort of rent-free in my mind for a long time, and that's exactly what's happened with this book. So this is a, um, a book written by an ex-junior doctor. You already know I love that sort of thing. Um, and uh, it's about a young unnamed, very clever, very much love that as well, doctor who has taken a job in an underfunded and failing hospital in East London. Um, and this time period spans over uh, the late 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and he has taken this job as he has previously um, had to leave another job because he became addicted to painkillers. So he's sort of taken just whatever work he can get. Now, in this hospital, as I've said, it's failing, it's underfunded, people are dying. Sometimes people die. But in this hospital, are a few more people dying than should be strictly necessary? There are some anomalies. And when this gets looked into, we are seeing this sort of investigation going on from an unnamed doctor who is also following this with horror, thinking what on earth is happening and looking at his peers around him and thinking who could maybe be linked to this or is this just bad luck, etc, etc. The tone of it was perfect. It was so gripping. Hospital noir, I've seen this described as. But it was just like a literary thriller of like page turner, page turner. Like a lot of these, I've got to say, books that I've read have been proper page turners this year. And, um, the, the tone of it, because um, Simon himself has been a junior doctor, it really, it, it was sort of tired and beleaguered and just, just about getting by. And that tone was reflected, that, that tone in that book is reflected so much in what life for junior doctors is like. It's really, really good, really page turny. I sort of had an idea of who might be at the heart of it and then was delighted that there was a little bit more to it than that. And yeah, really, really great book. Very much enjoyed it. Highly recommend. Um, the next book I, that I loved is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Um, I run a book club um, over on my Patreon page, which is always linked down below if you'd like to go and find out. And one, two, three, three of the books that we've read this year for book club have, a, have ended up on my best books of the year so far. We've just been having great books and great discussions. So well done everyone involved, well done me for picking some of the books, the, the polls and stuff, well done the Patreon guys for then going on and picking the book out of the poll, but this was the first one we read, so we read this in January, um, and the theme for that month was uh, 2022 releases, this is now out in paperback, if you'd like to go and get it, I mean look at the front cover of it, lovely, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin, this is a book, and at the heart of the book is gaming, and I'm not a gamer. Sure, I loved a bit of Crash Bandicoot when I was younger, a bit of Tomb Raider. Sure, I played a bit of Theme Hospital in my time, but it's not something that I spend a lot of my hours on, particularly now when I'm just reading all the time. Um, but this was a book that I'd heard a lot of stuff about. I'd seen appear on a lot of people's best books of last year, and I went to it with open heart and arms and eyes hoping that it would be good and it really really delivered so as i said gaming is at the heart of this book and we're following a friendship um, between two characters who meet in a hospital waiting room in the late 80s um and they spend um a summer um 
gaming together, playing games, and um, then that's the end of their contact. And then eight years later, they bump into each other, and off, off the back of this chance meeting, they come together and start creating games. Now, what I loved about this was the friendship in there, and the sort of like, how this friendship has evolved and gone through major sort of life events, the death of people, marriages, babies, that sort of thing, and how that friendship has maintained. Um, but also the creative process behind gaming and what goes into those games. And as I said, not being much, uh, not having it, <laughs> I'll say little to none, um, knowledge about the gaming industry. This was amazingly well balanced with that and the information and the intricacies of that with this friendship that was running through the book. I really loved it. It felt really special. If I can sort of liken it to something the relationships itself felt a little bit like the first time I read some John Green books when I was just like oh Gabrielle Zevin really gets what it's like to be mates with people and and have like difficulties within those friendships and being there for other people and I loved that but I also loved the gaming aspect of it as well and yeah there's it's, it's really written in like a really special way there's a couple of like sort of um chapters in here that were written in a way that I wasn't expecting and really took me by surprise and will stay with me for a very, very long time. There's sort of like gaming um, gaming terminology used and there's like non-player character chapter and stuff like that and stuff that I wasn't familiar with and didn't realise would translate so well into a literary device, but they absolutely did. So yeah, highly recommend as well. She's going to be saying highly recommend to all of these. They're the best 10 books of the year so far. Um, next up, first book from this author on this list um it's Babel by rf quang um this book oh god this i mean rf quang i'm really hoping that i can read all of her work this year i've got reservations on her next few books uh no not her next book uh, books that she wrote um which i think are ya but maybe quite grown up ya um there's a trilogy of books that she's written and I've got reservations on that. So I'd like to read like all of her works this year because I've just been loving it. But Babel, let's get on to Babel. Um, this is set in Oxford in 1836. Oxford is like the epicentre of everything that is wonderful about um, uh, knowledge and power. But also there's colonialism and other awful stuff going on there. And we're following a young Chinese immigrant who's been bought home, uh, bought from China to Oxford by a sort of mysterious guardian and um, is going to be working as a translator in Babel, which is a um, college in Oxford, which um, focuses on translation, but also focuses on this sort of like magic system. Now, <laughs> forgive me, because my explanation of magic systems, they ain't so good. Um, but there is where, um, whereby this magic system is that you will find um, a word um, and then a, a word pairing that might work with that in another language and pa pair those two words together and infuse the power of those words into a silver bar so that that silver bar can then do special stuff. The most, one of the ones that stayed with me a lot is that they can pair the words of like steady or stable, empower it into this silver bar and then put it in horse and carriages so that the carriage runs really smoothly. So that's like at its most sort of, I guess, basic level, but there's all sorts in there, sort of like combative stuff, stuff for food, all sorts and things like this. And yeah, it was just phenomenal. <laughs> it was so, and, and like me, I love reading a book where as you're reading it, you can literally feel things in your mind moving, thinking, ah, well, that makes sense now. And that makes sense now. And that may be, it's related, is that going to relate to something a bit later on? And like the whole, it was just such a mind opening thing to read. And I just loved it. I didn't want it to end. The ending, I was in absolute tears. And as well as having these sort of like this real, amazing magic system in there and this sort of like theme of colonialism and stuff going through that it also really focuses on things like friendship and um it feels a bit like a sort of campus novel type vibe in it as well despite being set in 1836 dark academia if you're into that sort of thing you'd really be into this i'm sure many many people have read it because it is phenomenal really 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 loved it Next up was Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield, another book we read for Patreon Book Club. Um, and this is sad. <laughs> so if you're looking on, I've said at the beginning of this video, you might want to take some of these books on holiday with you. This is 
a really really sad book <laughs> so don't don't feel like you have to if you don't want to take a really really sad book on holiday with you then don't um but we read this for the theme women in love and it's about um uh, a couple um and one of those um uh, one, one of the women in the couple um, is working on a submarine for many months and we um, we arrive at this story with um, Miri, I believe her name is, having not come back and her partner at home thinking she's dead, like that this is it, I haven't heard from her, the company hasn't heard from her, she can't even get through to the company, she hasn't, like this is something terrible and catastrophic's happened, I don't know what's going to happen to it. Anyway, she does return and when she returns she's vastly different and there's changes happening to her body and their relationship isn't what it used to be and it's all very very ominous and very reminiscent of what it might be like to live with someone with a terminal illness and in particular I was thinking um, Alzheimer's um, because of the degeneration of what that person was able to do before this happened to them and afterwards and it's tragic and it's so sad and so confronting I loved it. It's so beautifully written and there's real sort of like, so when we're hearing about um, the the wife who is still uh, is at home awaiting her wife's return, she's doing things like looking on forums about people who've had missing people in their lives and she finds this like really sort of like niche corner of the internet where people who've had, who are pretending that they're their, um, their partners have got lost in space and stuff like that and that was really sort of like oh um as well as this dealing with um her wife having returned from this trip and not being the same person she was i've seen it really penned as a horror and i wouldn't i mean it's horrific what happens in there but i never felt sort of um i guess i i, I associate horror with like ghosts and paranormal stuff and i guess there is an element of paranormal to this but yeah it didn't feel if you're not a horror reader i'm not either and i loved this so i think that's the message i'm trying to say there but yeah Maybe give that a go if you want to feel sad. <laughs> Don't give it a go if you want uplifting stuff. Um, next up is the marriage. By the way, I haven't got many of these books because if I've a lot of them I've got out from the library, and a lot of them, if I did own them, I've now pushed into the hands of other people and said, "Read that." Um, the next one is the Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. Um, this was um, one of only two books I liked from the Women's Prize for Fiction long list this year. Um, and yeah, this was great. It was this was also a, a lovely surprise to me because I tried reading this last year and didn't enjoy it. Thought it was a bit boring and sent my copy back to the library. And then when it got long listed for the Women's Prize, I was like, sure, I'll give it another go. And I'm so bloody glad I did because it was fantastic. It's set in the Italian Renaissance and we're following a young woman, Lucrezia, who right at the beginning of the book, we find out that she um, will be murdered by her husband. Um, and then uh, interspersed with these sort of like shorter chapters of her knowing that's gonna happen and sitting opposite her husband at, at dinner thinking, what is he planning now? Or trying to avoid, like, trying to think maybe how can she escape this, but she's in the middle of nowhere and her husband's a trained soldier and how on earth is she gonna get away from this? We're going back to longer chapters of her as a child and um, her parents meeting and her being betrothed to this man. And yet, <clears throat> true Maggie O'Farrell style is just written amazingly. Another real page turner. And I never really thought I would find a book about the Italian real estate. <laughs> a real page turner. There's stuff in there like really evocative stuff about art and um, tigers. And yeah, it's just, uh, again, a very, very special thing. Um, so yeah, loved this. Loved it so much. Um, next up. And the next book that we read for Patreon Book Club that I loved, and this was a very, very divisive one. So this is I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel. Um, another one, so my favourite from the um, Women's Prize for Fiction long list. Gutted it didn't get shortlisted, even more, well, gutted it didn't get it win, even more gutted it didn't even make the shortlist. Um, this was a real, like, as I said, divisive thing. We read this for Patreon Book Club as well. And <clears throat> this was sort of mad. Mad and clever and wild and bit grotty. So we're following an unnamed narrator, another unnamed narrator, um, and her um, online obsession with a woman who she calls um, the woman who is sleeping with the man that I'm obsessed with. So she's in a very toxic relationship with someone who she calls the man she's obsessed with. And this woman who has a very sort of visible online presence um, is sleeping with that man as that man has multiple partners. And the way he treats our unnamed narrator is a 
abysmal and um the unnamed narrator is sort of obsessed with him and this woman and the whole thing reads like um a sort of a social media post or social media post from within someone's head there's no sort of filters here and the stuff you're reading is like shocking and absurd because it's someone inside someone's mind who's thinking like wild stuff but then occasionally she'll say something that you completely agree with and it's so clear and clever you'll be like oh yeah and then you sort of have to be like oh god but what just because I agree with that doesn't mean I agree with everything else she's saying and like the whole feeling of it makes you feel a bit grubby and a bit ugh, and a bit uncomfortable but that's so clever and that's so amazing that a book can make me feel like that while still being really invested in what's going on and really, really glued to the action in here. Um, yeah, like I said, it was very, very divisive because it reads like a stream of consciousness and that's not for everyone. The book itself, again, I've lent it out to somebody. Um, some of it is just like one line on a page. So it read quite quickly, again, very page turnery for me. But it was just absurd and wild and, and, and unlike any sort of reading experience I've ever had and the more I talked about it and the more I think about it the more I think how layered and fantastic that this sort of feat of writing is because of the way it makes you feel and the way it makes you think about social media and the way in which you can get really invested in someone who you've never met life and feel feelings about that person and it really got me thinking about sort of fandom in general and the the sort of like intricacies of that and the wildness of that as well so yeah absolutely loved that book so much which then leads me on to my next favorite book because off the back of loving that book about sort of fandom and online presence and stuff like that a few people recommended to me idol burning by rin yasami now this is translated by uh, from the japanese and this is about a young girl who has a blog about her um her idol it's called idol uh, her oshi and this um person that she idolizes is in a boy band and the boy band takes um uh the boy band is is very sort of like again very present online and she's written a blog about him and people sort of come to her for her takes on things that have been going on within the band and there's an, an incident she talks about where one of the other boys in the band um hacks into her or she's um twitter and tweets a few like literally like seven word tweets and she knows instantly from the way that these seven word tweets are, are worded that that's not him so she's she's absolutely obsessed with him and she sp spends a lot of her time plowing money into this obsession whether it be in going to see um, them spending money on merch there's a sort of like voting system from within for, for the band on who's going to take sort of like vocals or who's going to lead this and her oshi is associated with the color blue so each of the boys in this boy band um, have a color associated with them and and there's a lot of talk about the color blue and like how much and that sort of like weaves through the whole book as well so this is all like wild and I was like this is enjoying this very much and then her um her idol hits somebody hits one of her fans and then everything sort of the shit hits the fan she said the word fan so many times and people are coming to her for her take on this and and what does she think's happening and what do you think's really going on behind the scenes and is it real and is this da -da -da? and yeah the whole fandom thing is just really blown wide open and i loved reading this and i loved reading i'm a fan and i'm really really interested to read more books like that Another one I would like to get my mitts on is YN by Esther Lee, which sounds quite similar to Idol Burning. And there was another one that Jen and I were talking about. Jen and I, so Jen and I went for a walk in May and we were, so we, would, we had a big long discussion about I'm a fan because we, we, we both enjoyed it. And I was reading Idol Burning at the time. Um, and then we were talking about that as well. I think she, is it called like Moon something? But yeah, any books, any recommendations you've got about sort of fandom and stuff, I'd be really interested in. But then, yeah, so off the back of that, I started thinking about fandoms that I'd been involved in and my experience with that. And yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a weird old playing field, isn't it, the old uh, fandom? But yeah, very much enjoyed both of these books that are about sort of like online presence and fandoms and stuff like that. Uh, next up was *The Memory of Animals* by Claire Fuller. Love a Claire Fuller book. Um, Claire Fuller's previously appeared on my best books of the year, but this one was amazing. So this is set during a pandemic and Claire Fuller actually wrote this book before the pandemic, which sort of blows my mind a bit because it's so, feels so much like a pandemic, like how the pandemic felt for people. Um, and yeah, so there's a pandemic going on and our uh, main character, Nephi, uh, volunteers for a clinical trial where she will test out the vaccine. And she goes into this clinical trial and while she's in the clinical trial in central London, um, 
shit really kicks off and she can see from outside her window that like life isn't like it was before she's gone in for this clinical trial um so it's told from three perspectives it's told from the perspective of claire uh, claire not claire claire's the author of nephi as she's in this building with people that she doesn't know because they've also volunteered for the clinical trial the staff have left them and they've just left these people who had volunteered for it in this um like place which is as i said in central london and she's able to look out the windows and see like buses that have crashed and people's apartments that haven't been visited and rubbish everywhere and all this sort of thing going on so there's that perspective there's also a perspective of her writing letters to somebody who you then find out a little bit later on who the letters are to and somebody within the um the facility with her has got this sort of like pioneering technology where people are able to visit um memories um as if they're present in them like revisit memories of themselves and there's that perspective as well of her going back into the past visiting her parents and getting to know her partner and that sort of thing I never wanted this to end I really didn't want it to end and I really um want, wanted it to I really wanted answers in terms of like what happened next it really read to me like I was watching a really gripping tv show that was like really well written with great like set up and great conversations between characters and every time we were in a perspective I wanted to get back to another perspective to see what was going to happen next and yeah I thought it was amazing and I really do hope it gets picked up by someone or some like a film or some like I just feel like it would make it was very cinematic the whole thing felt very cinematic and yeah I thought it was great but I'm aware like um pandemic novels aren't for everyone particularly <laughs> um after the last few years we've had but really really loved it penultimate book um was death of a bookseller by Alice Slater another absolute page turner and um sort of like literary thriller dual dual narrative um told mainly from the perspective of somebody called roach who works in a um a, a bookstore which is a chain bookstore called spines which is based on waterstones the, the author alice slater worked in waterstones for many many years as a bookseller so what i loved about this in the same way that i loved about tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow actually was that i love the sort of intricacies behind the book selling and it's set sort of like in the run up to Christmas and them trying to save this bookstore and and um what can they do to get things uh, working and people working nights in order to get things looking great and and stuff like that and I love the sort of like mundanities of that mixed with the fact that um we're following Roach who is a true crime obsessive I also will say I thought the um, observations on true crime and true crime podcasts and the sort of glamorization around that was were really really clever um she's a true crime obsessive and um a new bookseller comes in called Laura and the description of Laura and again I've lent this book out to somebody because I loved it so much sort of like um tea parties and she's got like vintage um vintage t-shirts and smells like roses and everyone seems to love her but Laura doesn't really like Roach very much and there's some like bad vibes there from the start off and then Roach became becomes quite obsessed with Laura after finding out some stuff about her background and stuff like that and yeah, it's just this sort of like, what is going to happen come the end of this book? Where is this? Where, what is the resolution here? Is it going to end the way I think it's going to end? Is there, is someone going to come to their senses and maybe some tragedy can be like avoided? But yeah, I really, really loved it. And again, another absolute page turner. So great. Like I said, banger after banger after banger. And then the last book, as I said, she'd be appearing again. And it's Yellow Face by Rebecca F. Quang. Um, I love to look into the, the details between writing as R.F. Quang for Babel and writing as Rebecca F. Quang for Yellow Face. Um, I only finished this last month. It's amazing. Amaz as amazing as I thought it was going to be. It's a book about deception it's a book about plagiarism it's a book about cultural appropriation and um, a little about the plot is that we uh, we're, we're following somebody called june hayward um who is loosely friends with somebody called athena lou um and june and athena are um out having drinks one night athena is an amazingly successful author um sort of compared a lot to sally rooney in sort of like success levels and june has had um mild to sort of little success with with writing she's had a book published but things haven't been <clears throat> going further the way she it thought it would and she's she's got this jealousy for athena and her and athena are, uh, are having drinks on a night out which doesn't happen very often but it does they end up going back to um, athena's house and athena dies in a in an accident now while june is there 
um, there is a manuscript of Athena's next book on her desk. She says she doesn't tell anyone anything about the book until it's finished. So um, June knows that this book is, nobody else has seen it. And she takes the manuscript and she takes some notebooks and she passes that book off as her own. Now that's wild enough as it is. And that's the sort of like plagiarism level of it. But then we come into the sort of like cultural appropriation level because um, Athena is Asian American and June is white. And June um, then publishes this book under her uh, her name, which is Juniper. So her full name is Juniper um, and her middle name is Song. And instead of publishing it as June Hayward, she publishes it as Juniper Song because that's got maybe like Asian connotations. And she does a lot of research and things like this. And people were sort of like, oh, I don't know how comfortable this is that she's maybe trying to be like ambiguously Asian American when that isn't something that's happened at all. Um, and yeah it was really really clever and thrilling and like actually heart felt felt like it was in my throat a lot of the time like when people when when it becomes more sort of like public that people aren't quite happy with what's happened with june in terms of her publishing this book and did she write it and like people maybe becoming a bit suspicious of her god it was like oh my god what is gonna happen here and like there really feels like there's some like spooky stuff going on here and yeah i really really loved it and like I said, I'm big plans to read all of Rebecca's work this year. Um, I've got uh, the Poppy Wars is the first in the the trilogy, and I've got a reservation on that at the library, and I will be reading that. But yeah, definitely my author of the year. Love, I would love to be able to read all of her work this year. Would absolutely love to. So there we go, my ten favourite books of the year so far. Uh, all bangers all absolute bangers so let me know if you've read any of these books let me know down below your 10 favorite books or, or some of your favorite books of the year would love to and um yeah i'll see you all again soon for another booktube video goodbye